It's good to be here this evening. Let's, um, I want to say let's all clap our hands and praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. But that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> let's all prepare our hearts to uh, give tonight. We're going to start passing the, the offering basket. I've actually, we were hesitant to do it, but I've had three or four people say, I forget to put money in the offering when I'm walking out the door. So here's your chance. If you're a visitor, uh, please don't feel obligated. But if the Lord's moving you, then this is an act of obedience to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here, Lord, for this uh, building that you give to us these lights, all the things, Lord, that you give to us to operate so we might preach your word. Pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to seek our hearts, uh, look deep into our hearts, Father God, that we would be obedient to you, not only in uh, what we do, Lord, but uh, how we spend the money that you give to us, Father God. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray that you would be with us tonight as we open your word. Pray that you would fix our hearts on you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen couple things very quickly. Um, if you want to put your finger in 1 John chapter 3, that's where we're going to be tonight. Um, next week will be the, the last Wednesday for this little series on evangelism that we're doing. Uh, last week, it was really awesome. We talked about false prophets and how false prophets would come to you in several different ways, not just uh, on the, through the TV screen. Today, we're going to be talking about love. And then next week, we're going to be talking, we're going to be in John chapter 1 talking about how to invite people to church. So some of these things are elementary, but they're very important for us not to forget. They're very important for us to actually mull over, as it were, and sort of put in the back of our pockets so we could have them when we're ready for them. But um, after that, we're going to jump right into the book of Exodus. Um, I think it's going to be an exciting time. If I could give you a couple things, um, I'm a Bible study guy. I love not only studying the Bible, but I love to teach the Bible. And so I want to not only give you guys uh, little tidbits. I want, to get, I want to give you an in-depth teaching of the Word of God, what God's trying to tell us through His Word. So as we open the book of Exodus, we're not just, just going to take a casual walk through it. We're going to get deep into it. I would like to take the, the black words that are on the white pages and put them right into your heart. In fact, the Bible says that God will write His Word on the tablets of your heart, and that's what I want to help do in, in what we do here on, on uh, Wednesday. So if you weren't here last week, I want to encourage you this week to bring your Bible. Bring your Bible with you. It's Bible study. Um, I'm going to hesitate to put the words on the walls there, and uh, I want you actually to, to see the top of your head, you know what I mean, in your Bible. Not only do I want to see the top of your head in your Bible here, but I want, I want you to be able to do this at home as well. So bring your Bible. Bring a pen. Bring a notebook. You know, it's really good for you to take notes. If you don't write things down, you forget many times. You know, uh, those of you young guys, uh, you know, you, you meet a girl on the, at the 16th Street Mall, you don't say, I'll memorize your number. No, you say, do you have a pen? You know, I want to write it down. See, the young guys are going, yeah, that's right, because you, want to, you don't want to forget it. So same thing with the Word of God. I had to get the guys motivated. So sorry, girls are rolling their eyes, by the way. So uh, you, want, you want to write things down, so that way you, you, you can refer to them. Some of you guys journal, which, by the way, I, I, I really recommend. I journal because I like to go back, uh, and I found notes that I've had uh, from years past from journaling, and the Lord's really spoken to me through those, through those notes. So I really recommend that you even journal. Write these things down. Go home and go back and study the text. But whatever you do, uh, be prepared to study the Word of God. Um, I want to bring it to life. That's my desire, that I would bring the Word of God to life to you, that I would give you things that you maybe haven't thought about. Um, you know, I do study. I do study, meaning that I read the text several times. I take several notes. If you see, I've, I've gone through several of these notebooks. These are great notebooks, by the way. And, um, you know, I wait till back to school time, and they're 50 cents each at Walmart, that place that I don't like to go. But um, uh, they have good bargains there for these notebooks. But get equipped. You know, get equipped. Get ready to not only hear the Word of God, but to mull over it, to, to have your heart focused on it. And let's go for it. You know, I'm not, I'm not Chuck Swindoll. So don't expect a Chuck Swindoll sermon. I'm not Billy Graham, you know, so uh, I wish I had his height, but I don't. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm Adam Gomez, and God has equipped me with the tools that he's given me to give you something from his word. And so I, I take a lot of pride in that. I, I take my time and study. And so, you know, it's not just something I throw together to, to say a few words on a Wednesday night, but that's what we're going to do. So we'll be in the book of Exodus. It might take us about a year to get through it. It's 50 chapters. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a long walk. And um, if, if I could put a banner up online, it'll probably say a walk to remember because that's really what it is. 
So with that, so I mean, I hope you're excited. I'm excited. So two more weeks. I was tempted on starting next week, but I really want to kind of give you the, 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 um, just some of, this, some of these bolts, the nuts and bolts of evangelism. When I say evangelism, sometimes we think of Billy Graham right away, but you are all evangelists. You are all equipped. If you're a believer, you're equipped. God has given you something so that you can share with non-believers. And uh, this week we're going to talk about love. So 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 16 through verse 24 if you're taking notes. Now throughout John's letter, just if I could set this up for you, we see him repeatedly talking about love, obedience, and truth. And at first sight, it could seem that John is simply repeating himself over and over. But I don't know if you've read 1 John, if you're a lover of, of the epistles, and you read these letters, you'll notice that he goes through these familiar topics, but he always takes, he always lands at different points of view. And, and I challenge you to read it with that, uh, with that frame, that mind of frame and, and as, as we talk about this. So if you go through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, um, it's almost like parking your car different every single time. And you, you park in the same space, but maybe you drive a different way around the block to park in the same space. And that's where John goes through. So we might see this repetitiveness, but the point of view that we see here in chapter 3, John sums up this chapter just very quickly. I'm just giving you a little bit of tidbits. In 1 John 3, 14, he says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So we love the brethren. When I become a Christian, I no longer have bitterness. I no longer have hatred. I no longer have strife in my heart because something has evidently happened to my heart. This is new. It's a new life. This is different. You know, at a men's breakfast several years ago, I'll never forget, we were sitting in the men's breakfast and one of the guys shared that he, he had gotten into a fight. And, uh, you know, of course, we were like, man, what's going on, brother? You know, do you need some help? And, uh, and he said, no, I took care of it by myself. No, he didn't say that. But, you know, he, we said, what's going on? Can we pray with you? And he says, he told the story about how he was in this fight. And, and midway, midway through this fight, he stopped fighting and he started apologizing to the guys that he was working over. And we were all, of course, so shocked and wanted to know how this could happen. And you know how it happened? Because he said, God changed my heart. God changed my life. And, and he ended up uh, having to call the authorities on himself. And I mean, it was just an ordeal. And, but it was wonderful because he ministered to all the guys at the men's breakfast that God changed my life. I no longer do the things that I used to do. I no longer act the way that I used to act. I no longer have hate in my heart. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have a bad day. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have a bad week. That doesn't mean that something's not going to rub you the wrong way, especially in Denver traffic. You know, I, I go to Southern California a lot, and man, when I go there, I drive the I-5 with a smile on my face sometimes. Uh, when you're going through the I-25 down by Evans and whatnot, you know, Arapaho Road, forget about it, right? So, I mean, uh, you might get angry even in traffic, but the thing about it is there's always going to be a conviction from the Holy Spirit, especially when it comes to those who you're trying to hate. If you've had a family member or you've had a situation with a friend, or it could even be an ex-spouse for some of you guys who've been through the uh, unfortunate uh, peril of divorce, and you have some feelings, you have some emotion there, and, and, but when you become a Christian, it's hard to hate that person. In fact, you even get frustrated because you want to have these negative feelings for that person, but you just can't. And you have these discussions with God and you fill up 25 journals because you're saying, Lord, but I want to have these bad feelings for that person. And he says, no, but I died for you and I forgave you for your sins and, and you have to love. But we're changed, aren't we? There's several people shaking their heads because you understand exactly what I'm saying. And, and John sums this up and, and he actually starts us off by saying this. We know that we have passed from death to life. Let's read that again. We know, we know, we know that we have passed from death to life because we have love for the brethren. This is amazing to me that we move into this love, that we uh, immediately we feel love and compassion for, for the people that we didn't feel love and compassion for before. It's a miraculous thing. And now we're going to move into this section that I really want to emphasize on, the believer's relationship with other believers. And why I want to give this to you is because unbelievers are watching us. Remember I said last week that we're being watched. We're being looked at at every turn by our coworkers, by our family, uh, even by our enemies, and, and I don't know if you've ever made, uh, made up with an enemy before, but it's wonderful when you're able to share Christ with an enemy, and they just think, wow, what in the world happened to you? And you're saying, I'm glad you asked. But the world is watching, and if you're taking notes this evening, please jot this somewhere. 
all true Christians have been born of God, which means that all true Christians are brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me say that again. All true Christians have been born of God, which means that all true Christians are brothers and sisters in Christ. John's about to introduce us to two types of Christians that I see here, if you're taking notes. Number one is the passive Christian, and let me explain that. The passive Christian, if you're a passive Christian tonight, you're a Christian who merely does no evil to his brothers and sisters. You're just passive. You don't, you don't do any evil to your brothers and sisters. You're just getting along in life. You, you're not doing any wrong. And you're just a pa- you're that passive Christian when it comes to this thing called love. Number two, we have the active Christian. If you're an active Christian, you're the type of Christian who sees a need in the lives of your brothers and sisters and positively responds. Now, automatically, we bring that up, and we know people like those two, in those two categories in our own lives. We know them. We work around them. We, we know them by name. We, in fact, we know those people's names who come to mind who are always active at church events, who are always active when somebody has a funeral, when somebody's getting married, when somebody's going through a rough trial. They're cooking food. They're cleaning houses. They're doing all this stuff. They're, they're in this activity, this active love towards the brethren. Then you have the rest of us who, hey, I, I fit in both categories sometimes. And what do we do? We passively live for the Lord. We don't bother anybody. We stay out of people's business, you know what I mean? And we just passively love people. I love people. I, I call them hippie Christians. We're hippie Christians. You know, I just love everybody. You know what I mean? All we need is love. You have that CD playing all the time. But if you're an active Christian and when it comes to this thing called love, you're involved in people's lives. When somebody calls and says, hey, I need a hand, you go give them a hand. If when somebody has a need, you're there. If you see somebody's downtrodden face, you come and say, hey, are you okay, brother? Are you okay, sister? Can I pray with you? Can, do you have anything that you need? I think you get the point. So we have these two types. And you know what? Before we Before we break into these two types of Christians and we unpack these few verses, the Bible says in verse 16, by this we know love. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. So let's break this down. Before John even presents us with these two types of Christians, he makes sure that a solid foundation, an example of true love can be painted to be displayed by God's love for a sinful world. Think about this, John 3, 16. You all know this. And I'm giving you some of these easy reaching, sort of the low hanging fruit so you could take note, but also remember. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is the love that, that God had, that God still has. And if you're in the room today and you don't know the Lord and you don't know that he loves you, he loves you that much that he gave his life for you. He gave his very life for you. Jesus decided to leave the royalty of heaven and come to this earth. Can you imagine that? I don't know if any of you have teenagers, but if you've ever entered their room, I mean, you get out really quick. And I think about that every time I enter my teenagers' rooms, you know what I mean? They're not here, so don't tell them I'm talking about them. And, And what happens? You get hit with this smell that you haven't smelled in a long time, you know what I mean? Especially if you have a teenage boy. Teenage girls, they have some perfume stuff. It you know, smells good. But teenage boys, it's like, you know, and your eyebrows go up and you can't breathe. You know what I mean? And you're trying to reach for the doorknob with your eyes closed. You know what I mean? To close that door. But the truth of the matter is that I, I actually have thought about this, that Jesus came into the door of the world. This filthy place. This place that is full of corruptness. This place is full of abuse and non-love, hatred. And he came in and he, he loved us so much. He loved the world so much that he was willing to leave the royalty of heaven to come to this earth to save a few. That's true love. That's true love. Another writer says, and I can't remember the passage right offhand, um, anybody would give a, a, their life for a, maybe a family member, a close friend, but who would give their life for a stranger? Jesus gave his life for strangers. It's true love. And so we see this here. We see that Love is painted and it's displayed. His his love for a sinful world is displayed. And we know that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is very possible that you were raised in a household that didn't have love. And so it's hard for you to comprehend this. And I I, I deal with people all the time as a pastor, as a, a biblical counselor. I deal with people all the time who say, listen, I don't really know how to love my wife. 
I don't really know how to love my husband. You don't understand. I was abused when I was a kid. I was never hugged. You know what? I grew up in a household where I, I never seen my mom and dad kiss before. They never really held hands. They never really, the only time they held hands is uh, my wife and I treated them for a trip on a plane and they, my dad hadn't been on a plane since he got out of the military. And uh, when, when that plane left the ground, my dad held my mom's hand so tight that, I mean, the blood vessels were bursting. So that's the only time I saw them hold, hold hands. And when the wheels touched the ground, he went like that, you know. They're just, they're, they're old fashioned in, in some ways, but they didn't show a lot of affection in front of us kids. We didn't really get a lot of hugs. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not blaming my parents. They're very loving parents. We know that they love us so much, but we didn't really get a lot of those hugs. Now, when I met my mother-in-law, there was a whole different story. You know, my, my, my wife was kissing her brother on the lips, you know, little peck. And I'm just going, whoa, what did you just do? She's going, what's, what's the big deal? What's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Can I tell you a quick story? So um, I lived with my mother-in-law before I got married. My, my wife had a, an apartment with a roommate, and I lived with my mother-in-law in her basement. And I'll never forget, they were just a, such a close family. I'll never forget, I'm taking a shower, and I hear somebody brushing their teeth. And I mean, I'm just like, what in the world is going on? And then I hear another voice in there, good morning, mom. And I'm just thinking, I just felt so exposed, man. You know, I mean, the shower curtain's there, but I'm just going, what in the world? You know, I was just waiting for somebody else, a stranger to pull up, you know, I don't know. But I mean, they just, they're just such a close family. Maybe you're raised in a family like that where you're so close and you had that affection shown to you and, and so much love. Well, you know what? Not everybody was raised like you. Some, some people were raised without that affection. They never knew what it meant to be hugged all the time or to be praised all the time. Let's even go down a more tragic road. Maybe you were raised in a house where you were told you're worthless. Maybe you were raised in a household where your father or mother told you you're not going to amount to anything. Maybe there was a lot of negativity in your house to where you're, you're, you have this relevant background factor that's affecting everything you do today. I want to tell you something without getting deep into it. Jesus can rescue you from that. You need to listen to the voice of God, and the way you listen to it is through His Word. Read His Word. Let Him tell you that He loves you so much. Let Him show you that He has such an awesome plan for your life. Because the voices that we hear from human beings are just that. They're voices from human beings. And it's false, it's false voices. It's false doctrine. Sometimes parents don't know how to raise their kids because they were taught that stuff themselves when they were young. They were told that they weren't going to be good mothers. They were told that they would never be good fathers. They had the same abuse and it goes on and on. You know, and there are very relevant background factors that shape our reaction or interaction with others. If you were abused, as I said, uh, chances are that you might even be abusive to others. If you were never hugged or physically loved on by a parent or a sibling or family member, chances are that you will not find value in an embrace or a loving touch by your spouse or even by your children. If I could share with you and be very transparent, when, when my children were born, I told my wife, I don't really know how to be a good dad. I just don't really know how to be a good dad. And the scriptures teach me how to be a good father. But I don't really know. And, and I asked my own wife, you need, to, you need to remind me if I'm not hugging my children. And she takes me up on that. She'll say, hey, you need to, you need to talk to them and tell them you love them. You need to do these things. Because it wasn't, it wasn't given to me. So I don't automatically do these things. When my, when my son was growing up, it was hard for me to embrace him. Because my father put it into my heart that that was a feminine act to hug another man, even if it was your son. And so I would force myself. I know this sounds really cruel. You're probably thinking, what in the world is this guy going? But, you know, I had to force myself to embrace my son. But then right when I, when I said, Lord, I'm going to embrace him, I'm going to show him my love, I would just pull him towards me and just give him that strong hug and tell him, I love you, son. And you know what? Deep inside, there's everything was screaming, this is not right. This is wrong. But you know what? When you're raised in that environment, that's all you know. You don't find the value in that. You may have been shown absolutely no love while growing up. And so you may feel that you have absolutely no foundation on which to judge for yourself what true love looks like or how to identify uh, this, this love that John's talking about. But you know what? The apostle will not let you out of it. He's not going to allow you the psychiatry couch or as a believer in Jesus. He's not going to allow you to have an excuse. The Bible says, by this we know love. By this we know love. We know it because he gave his life for us. You know love. You know love. 
the, the, mo the moment that you give your life to Jesus, you're going to experience love. You're going to experience love because you know what you're going to experience? A weight that comes off you that you've been holding on to for all of your life. And I've seen this over and over. And as an evangelist, I've preached the gospel around the country and I've watched people give their life to the Lord and they put their hands in their face and they can't stop crying. You know why? Because they're experiencing the love of God. They're experiencing this true love. Is it emotional? You got a lot of pastors that say, I don't believe in emotions. Well, they need a hug. It's emotional. And you put your face in your hands and you cry and you can't believe that this God of the world, this God who created heaven and earth has come down and touched you and taken the, the weight of sin off of your heart. And that's true love. That's an embrace. There's value in that. So John isn't going to let us get away with it. We know that by this we know love. I'd like to take a moment to speak about this topic or the lack thereof. I really thought about this this week. In the lives of children today, I work with a lot of young people. And, um, you know, I speak in a lot of, uh, it's been a little while, but I speak in a lot of uh, uh, youth jails, youth facilities. I speak in a lot of prisons. Um, as I told you before, I'm one of the chaplains that goes to Sterling Correctional and, and also to Lyman. And um, I'm going to tell you something. A 50-year-old guy could still be stuck in a child's body or in a child's mentality because they might have went to prison as a young person and they've never grown to really understand what it means to be an adult. And so when you bring up some of these topics, they'll start bawling, they'll start crying, and they'll start telling you, you know what, man, I, I, don't even, I can't even identify with this. I'm not worthy of this. But you know what? I'd like to take a moment and, and just speak about this lack of love in the lives of children today. And I wrote some things down, and there's a very real fear about the future of our country concerning youth violence and crimes committed by youth. Studies have shown that although the human brain is not fully developed until age 20 or 25, the first 24 months of a child's life are most important for nurturing and shaping the health of the brain. A child must be hugged and held and cared for and played with. A child must have person-to-person -person interaction and reactions to faces, reactions to noises, reactions to certain cries and silences even. Unfortunately, these nurturing habits are not always the norm, especially in poverty-stricken communities across our country, which that's where I grew up in, in a poverty-stricken area. And, and we see the lack of love there. A 2011 report on child maltreatment showed that more than five children die every day as a, re as a result of child abuse. And I always have hesitant to share this because I know that some of you have dealt with this, but this is the truth. We need to speak about some of these things because this is the result of the lack of love. There is tons of evidence that shows that most sociopaths were raised in a non-loving, non-nurturing environment that led them to take in a person's life. And you know what? Recently, it's even been a parent's life. That's, that's not only lack of love. There's some hatred there. After years of trying everything to create programs that were developed to curb youth violence, policymakers are re realizing that there is a real connection between the breakdown of American families and various social problems. Recent studies have proven that children born into single-parent families are much more likely than children of that of intact families to fall prey to this. And mothers, single moms, don't, don't give up and walk out just yet because the truth of the matter that studies have shown that a love from a mother and a touch from a mother will take away some of this pain, some of this anger, some of this angst. What happens in a single mother's life, and I deal with single mothers all the time again, is that they feel abandoned. And, and I even get told many times from single moms, I don't know how to raise my son. I'm not a man. I'm not their dad. I don't know what to do with them. And I always tell them, you know what? Do you tell them you love them? Say, well, yeah, we, I tell them I love them by buying them video games. I tell them I love them by giving them money. I tell them, but do you just sit there and embrace them and tell them, you know what, son, I love you. I love you, and you're going to be something so special if you, would just, if you would just seek the Lord with all your heart, if you would just pray to the Lord, if you would just get on the right path with God. You're going to be something. You're so special, son. And sometimes they say, I don't know how to do that. You know, doesn't he, he need uh, a man's guidance? Doesn't he need all this stuff? And, and I always say, you know what? It would be nice to have, but he doesn't have that. So don't rob him of the things that you can give him. And statistics show that women, that single moms who just love their children to death, those children grow up in a, in a better environment. They go to school. They go to college. They do different things. They make different choices than if they had the lack of love. Over the past 30 years, the rise in violent crime paralyzed, paralyzed excuse me, the rise in families abandoned by fathers. A message to fathers. You know what? I don't care how 
If we could get some help over here. Father God, we just come before you right now, Lord. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit right now would move in your power, Father God. Lord, that you would just deal with the situation right now, Father God, that you would bring peace and calm in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Do you need an ambulance? Okay. Okay. Good. When we sum up the findings of professional literature on juvenile delinquency, we see that studies have shown and research has shown that children raised in supportive, affectionate, and accepting homes are less likely to become deviant, and children rejected by parents are among the most likely to become delinquent. What am I saying here? And, and uh, I know we're, we're, we're kind of shocked and whatnot, but they've got it, they've got it under control, okay? And just keep praying that the Lord would just be there, and uh, they would like us to even go on, Okay. So we see that it's shocking, but it's not at all surprising that statistics reveal that a study of 14 juveniles that were condemned to death in the U.S. showed that they were, they were abused. They were not loved. They were not only abused, some of them were even abused to the point where they almost suffered death. Now, this stuff is shocking right off the bat. We're shocked by it. We, we, we hear this and we go, my gosh, what neighborhood are you pulling those statistics out of? I hate to tell you folks, but it happens in your suburban neighborhoods too. It's just hidden. You know, you might see a family that looks put together. They have the nice house. They have the nice car. They have the, the great jobs. But if there's a disconnect between those parents and that child, especially if the disconnect goes as deep as communicating to the child that they're worthless, communicating to the child that they're nothing, that they're going to be bad mothers, bad fathers, bad family members, bad people to society, there's something going on right there. Can I just mention Columbine? Can I mention Columbine? And again, not to point the parents out at all, except that they admitted that they didn't really know exactly what their kids were doing in the basement of their own house. We need to be connected. We need to be connected to our children. And this isn't a message just about children, but we might as well just boil this point over because it's very important. We need to be connected in our own houses to each other. And I'm going to tell you something. With the internet and with the rise of computers in every, every room, we could be so foreign and so separated by one wall that separates us. And we come out, maybe we come out to go get a Twinkie from the refrigerator or something. And we pass each other on the way out. And hi, mom. Hi, dad. That's not the way we should be. We should be connected because it, we're bound by this love. Well, because the Bible says, Jesus says here in Matthew 19, 4, if you're taking notes, he says, suffer or allow the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. And so the Lord loves the little children. But he also warned us in Matthew 24, 12, that because of abounding lawlessness, the love of many would grow cold. And I believe that we're living in that time today. The love of many has grow, grown cold. I see it every day. I see it how people treat each other. I'm dealing with a family right now whose, uh, whose siblings are suing each other. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't believe it. I, I deal with family members who, uh, whose child has taken somebody's life within the family. And, you know, as a pastor, I get all this stuff. I, I hear all this stuff. I get these emails. I minister to these people. So I see a lot of things that maybe you don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. But the, the, love of, the love of many is growing cold in, in our day. My warning to you is that you might not want to find yourself losing that love in the body of Christ. You know why? Because people are watching. If you want to reach your loved ones, if you want to reach your family, if you want to reach your fr friends, you need to have true love for each other. I know this speaks to some of you because there's divisions within the churches. I'm a pastor. I know. I'm, I'm part of several uh, organizations or, or several groups where there's, there's divisions in churches going on. We had a division here at Crossroads, didn't we? And we, we were able to even love on the people who, who left for whatever reason, and they, they're coming back, and we love on them, and hopefully you are getting that if you've come back. But we need to have that love. There's even been some accountability within the leadership to say, you know, we can't have any type of negative anger or negative retribution for, for somebody who left or whatever reasons it might have been. 
I know this is uncomfortable a little bit, but we got to deal with it because the truth of the matter is that there's no boundaries in heaven. There's no walls in heaven se separating the church of Christ over here, the first church of Nazarene over here, crossroads from over here. No, we're going to go to heaven and be together. But you know what? Are we going to go to heaven with hate in our heart for our brothers and sisters? Don't kid yourself. The Bible says that you better measure yourself, measure your heart to make sure that you know you're a believer. And part of knowing you're a believer is knowing that you have love for the saints. Didn't we just read that? These statistics might underline and highlight and explain this, this whole cause of the lack of love. But John chapter 4 here says, or he says here, that the supernatural love of Jesus reached out to an abandoned demon-possessed man. We see this in John chapter 4, that he, he reached out and, in, in, uh, and he cured this, this demon-possessed man. The love of Christ is so powerful that even a demon-possessed man could understand the love of Jesus. We need to have that type of love that reaches out. We see that Jesus displayed his love, and this is where I was going, sorry, in John chapter 4. We see that he displayed this love to this woman at the well, this supernatural love. He reaches out to this demon-possessed man, and I want to give you some of this because you need to understand that Jesus' love is so powerful. We have this picture hanging in our kitchen, and I love it. It says, I asked Jesus how much he loved me, and he spread out his arms, and he said this much. You know what? The Lord loves you so much but he wants you to love others. I think I'm driving this home tonight. Verse 16, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let me give you two things. We have, of the flesh, we have self-preservation. If you're living life through your flesh, you're gonna try to be self-preserved. You're not gonna wanna give your life for anything. Let's read this again. Verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This speaks deeply to me. Laying down your life is not just dying. Can I tell you something? And I know this sounds flamboyant, but dying is easy. It's easy to die. Now, it's not easy to choose to how you're going to die and whatnot, but you know what? It, living is hard, isn't it? I've ta I talked to uh, many uh, elderly folks who are, you know, maybe they have a sickness or an illness or whatnot, and they'll, they'll say, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have saved more money. Because living is hard. Living is difficult, not just living to try to support yourself, but living with the problems that come your way every single day. It's not just the pains and agony of your body. It's the pains and agony of life, the emotional structure of this life that constantly hits on you. And so we know that living is hard to do. Well, what, what does he say here? He says, we know love because he laid down his life for us. And so we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. John, what are you talking about? I got to die? John would say, yes, you need to die. You need to die to yourself. You need to be able to lay down your life for your brothers. And if you're living in the flesh, you're trying to self-preserve yourself. You don't want to die. We had the two categories of Christians earlier, and now we have the two categories again facing us. That means when somebody's in need, we want to have self-preservation. We don't want to go out of our way to help them. We want to self-preserve. We, we need to relax. We need to, we need to have energy for ourselves. We don't want to go out of our way to help our brothers and our sisters. We want to self-preserve. It might cost us something. Listen, living for Jesus is going to cost you something, and reaching out to your family and friends is going to cost you something. Reaching the world, it costs some people everything. I have a friend who goes to the Sudan quite often, and you know what? Every time he gets on a plane and he goes, he always says, I might not come back. I might not come back. I'm going with the knowledge that I may not come back to the United States. What is that driven by? It's driven by love, folks. It's driven by love. Why? Because the love of Christ is in that person, and they're not living by the flesh. They're living by the Spirit, and there's no more self-preservation. They don't care if they live or die anymore. But if we live by the Spirit, we're going to have self-sacrifice. Does that make sense? We're going to have self-sacrifice. So what does that mean? This is going to rub you the wrong way because it rubs me the wrong way. But that means that that person in your family that you hate, let's get real tonight, that person in your family who you can't stand, that means that God wants you to love them. He wants you to forgive them. Now, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you're to offer yourself like a doormat and just get walked all over and empty out your bank account. No, but you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to love them. Maybe it is worth a phone call to say, listen, can we have coffee? No, I hate you. 
Okay, well, listen, I want to tell you, I want to have a coffee with you to tell you that I'm, I want to ask your forgiveness. And they may never forgive you. They may throw rocks at you. You're not responsible for how they react. You're responsible for your own heart because God wants you to love them. Maybe you have a friend that you're distant from. Maybe they did you wrong. Maybe the wrong that they did to you is legitimate. Maybe it's even worth a lawsuit. And you need, to be, you need to be very wise. The Bible says be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You could have a lawsuit to, to make things right, but you can't have hate in your heart towards somebody. In other words, if, if, you have to, if there's a lawsuit that's going on in the community that you have to be part of because it's a class action or something happened that, that, that's fair, that there's a lawsuit, and you don't have to have hate in your heart for something that's going on. And by the way, wouldn't it be better if you just didn't have that lawsuit at all? Let me throw something else to you. The Bible says that as a brother and a sister, we shouldn't sue each other. We should be able to come to the pastor. We should be able to come to the elders. We should become, be able to come to biblical counseling and work it out because we love one another. Does that make sense? We should have this love for one another. And I know this, is, this is, doesn't make sense to our American minds. Can I just... Fill you in on something? We don't serve an American Jesus. Jesus is not American. He doesn't walk around with Levi's and wear shades, you know what I mean, and drive a convertible Lexus or something. No, he's universal. He's the Jesus that died, and you know what? He loves the people in the Sudan also, and he wants them to forgive the people who are killing them. Some of the articles, if you're reading them, that are coming out of the Sudan and the, in Syria, there's a genocide going on in Syria right now. But you know what? I've read so many articles where the people who are about to be killed, executed, are saying, hey, I want to tell you something. I love you. I love you. And I'm praying for you right now. And I pray that you would give your life to Jesus. That's true love. But we can't even forgive our neighbor who took our parking space in the church parking lot. You know what I mean? We can't even forgive our brother or sister who offended us. John here is saying, listen, you know you've passed from death to life because you have love for the brethren. Boy, I'm getting off base. Let's, let's keep going on. Well, verse 17 tells us how. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? That's the question that John's asking. How do we do this? You know what? This is the passive Christian right here. We just say, hey, be, be well fed, but we don't do anything. We see our brother in need, but we shut up our heart from them. How does the love of God? This is the question. It's a good question. How do we love people if, we're, if we just see a brother in need and we don't address it? Well, I wrote this down because I, I always think about this stuff. And in order to meet the need of my brother, I must have a couple of things. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. And I want to turn there. Ephesians 4, 28. Lord, we lift up our sister to you right now. Amen. Ephesians 4.28. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. Why do I bring that up? Because number one, if you're taking notes, and I think you should take notes on this, in, or, in order to meet someone's need, the need of my brother, I must have the means to do it. I must have the means to do it. So a person too poor to help is not condemned. Does that make sense? If you have nothing to give, how could you give from that? Now, if you're creative, you could figure something out. But please don't feel like, oh man, you know, I can't give five bucks to every, every time I stop at the stoplight here on Kipling and I-70. Well, if, if you don't have the means to give, which even on that, can I tell you that I'm friends with Brad Miley down at the Denver Rescue Mission, and it's, it's more fruitful to give to the Denver Rescue Mission because there's so many programs. It's a wonderful, and this isn't a commercial for, he didn't ask me to say this tonight, but it's, it's a wonderful program where if you, when you give down there, they're able to pour into the lives of, of, of young men and young women, and I could go through the whole thing, but they have such, such uh, ample resources to give, but sometimes people are giving those quarters out on, on the street corners. Now, if the Lord's telling you to give a quarter, give a quarter. Don't make this a law, you know what I mean? Don't get all stirred up with, well, I don't give. You know, come on, man. Love, have the love of Jesus in you. But if you give a quarter there, go downtown and give them a quarter too because they, they need your money. 
But if you don't have to give, you, you know what? You're not condemned. But I must have the means to do it. And, and Ephesians 4.28 says that if I, if I get wealth, I'm to share it. But it's, it's also telling me that I need to quit stealing too. Number two, I must, I must qualify that the need exists. This is an important one, especially as Christians, because sometimes we're, not, we're foolish with God's money. I've got to qualify that the need exists. Now, what I'm not telling you, I always clarify myself because I don't want you leaving this place going, Pastor Adam said not to help anybody. No, you need to qualify that the need exists. That doesn't mean that you, that you t- put this person through 20 questions, but you need to ask the questions. You need to know the person. You need to know what's going on. Is it a real need or is it more of a want? Is it a real need or is it more of a want? And I could go on a bunny trail there. I'm not going to. Does the needy person desire accountability? This is a big one within the body of Christ. This is a big one because many times people, people want you to help them, but they want it for help's sake. They don't want the accountability that comes with it. Folks, as believers in Jesus, as Christians, as the body of Christ, we need to be willing to accept accountability when we're in need. When I need a place to stay and you open your doors for me to stay there because whether I'm between jobs or I'm homeless or whatever it might be, I can't move into your place as a brother or a sister in Christ. I can't move into your place and expect for you to follow my rules. No, I need to humble myself and be accountable. That means when you ask me, hey, have you, have you looked for a job today? I need to not get angry and say, well, and call my sister or whatever who I should be living with anyway and say, well, this person's being mean because they asked me if I'm looking for a job. If, if the person you're staying with says, hey, are you serving the Lord? Are you going to Bible study? Well, this person just wants to know my religious background. You know, no. You, you know what? As, as if you're calling yourself a brother and sister in the Lord, you need to be accountable to these things. We forget this many times because we just want to be, and, and I'm using this word in a different context, we want to be passive Christians where we, we're just a doormat for anybody to use. God can't bless that, by the way. If you come to me and say, man, I went broke helping this person, I'm going to ask you the questions. Did you keep them accountable for what their responsibilities were? And you're probably going to say, no, I, you know, I didn't want to bother them. I didn't want to get in their business. Well, then you, you know what? God couldn't bless the relationship that you had with that person, even in helping them out. Because the, God's, you know what? God's goal, you could write this down. God's goal is not for you to be happy, but to be holy. God's goal is not for you to be happy, but to be holy. So you know what? You might not be too happy where you're staying. That's okay. But if you come out holy, then you're going to be right on the right track. If that person is keeping you accountable and, and you're, you're able to say, man, I learned so much from that person, from that family. And I, I guess I'm just dealing with one thing. But even if you're helping somebody, there needs to be accountability and there needs to be a real need more than a want. Number three. I must not depend so greatly on social agencies in order to escape my need to obey. You know, the Bible says, Let's, let us do good, especially to those in the household of, household of faith. But as Christians, many times, we count on social programs. You know what we say? And I've, I've said this before. I'm, I'm, I'm standing up here in the spotlight. I admit I've done this before. Well, the welfare will help them. Welfare will help them. That's what it's made for, to help somebody in need. But you know what? The truth of the matter, you, brother and sister, it's your responsibility to help your brother and sister in the household of faith. You know, in the first century Rome, and there's tons of books written on these things, in first century Rome, the government was upset for one thing. In fact, the Christians got the government so upset. Why? Because the government wouldn't even help anybody with food or clothing, but the Christians were helping them. In fact, there's, a, there's a letters written from governor to governor um, complaining about Christians who are making the government look bad. They're making us look bad because they're taking care of the poor. They're taking care of the sick. They're taking care of the elderly. When, 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 they, when they take a, a, a child and dispose of them at the dump because they can't afford to take care of them, guess what? The Christians go get that body and raise that child. They're making us look bad while we should still be making the government look bad with what we do. And number four, we should not do it for monetary, or we should not think we could help out with monetary only or money only. We have time and treasure to help out too. You could help your brother or sister out by helping them go put up a fence, watching their child while they go out for a date. But even in deeper need, when somebody's really needy, maybe you don't have any money, but you could, you could 
have somebody sleep in your basement for a while. Again, be careful because you don't just want anybody sleeping in your basement. You need to have wisdom. You need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But this is true love. And I know we're getting really practical here, but if we can't get practical, then what good, uh, what good are we doing with the Word of God? We need to have practicality with the Word of God. And this is practicality. Verse 18. Oh, I better turn back to 1 John 4. 1 John 3, sorry. Verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And this sums it up. If a brother or sister, James chapter 2 says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what, is, what use is that? What good is that? That's a good question. That's a good question. I think it sort of lingers in the air as something we should not do. Verse 19, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. By the way, it's one of my favorite scriptures. But these three things, uh, prom- there's three promises given to us who obey this love. Number one, we're assured uh, and we have confidence of Christ's appearing. We know that we are of truth and shall, and shall assure our hearts before him. And that we, we're going to see God. We're going to be assured that God's going to, we're going to see him one day. Number two, we're going to have answered prayer. And number three, we're going to abide in the place of Christ. We're going to abide with him. You know what? We have these promises here. We have the word of God that shows us we need to love one another. Now let's sum this up very quickly. Let's turn the coin on this. If we don't do these things, Jesus said, they will know you by what? The love that you have for one another. Now, it sounds so easy, doesn't it? It sounds so just easy to just love. Well, you haven't had any strife in your life then from somebody close to you. It's not easy to love. It's easy to love somebody who likes you. It's easy to love somebody who adores you and puts you on a pedestal, but the moment somebody slights you, it's hard to love. It's a challenge to love. And so as the body of Christ, we need to get over the things in our hearts that are tearing us apart. The book of James is a great book, and it also says in the book of James that you are, you are tearing each other apart like ravenous wolves. As a pastor, I see this in the church. Can I tell you that I'm the type of person to keep somebody accountable for it. Even within our own church, I'll keep people accountable. Why? Because the Bible says to do that. We can't go forward with hate in our hearts. I don't care who it is. I don't care what they've done to you. You can't have hate in your heart. The Bible says that hate is like murder. You can't do it. It's, it, it doesn't equal eternal life. Jesus even said, if you can't forgive your brother, how can I forgive you? How? how? I mean, we could try to twist it every which way. We could try to explain the doctrine this way, the theology this way. You better listen to Jesus. If you're holding on to that against a brother or sister tonight, it's time for you to let it go. That's the first thing. Because the rest will follow. What is the rest? People will see the love that you have for one another, and they'll exalt God who's in heaven. It'll happen. You know, I was visiting with a friend. My wife and I were visiting with friends the other night. And uh, they brought up a situation that happened between myself and another Christian. And uh, it was sort of a one-way street because um, I didn't react. And this person had so much blame for me. And they, they had a lot of hateful words to say to me. And I said, I'm sorry. And later on, this person pulled me aside and said, why did you apologize? You didn't do anything. And I said, you got to understand that if that person thinks that I did that to them, they experienced that emotion. They experienced that, that feeling that I did something to them. So I apologized. And they couldn't wrap their mind around it. And they said, well, but you did nothing. You did nothing. I don't understand this because you did nothing. And I said, you know what? The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we might be children of God. 
And because I'm a child of God, I'm willing to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I rubbed you the wrong way. I'm sorry if you believe that that's what happened. I apologize. And the Bible says a soft word turns away wrath. And you know that me and that person are some of the closest friends right now. But that could have turned ugly, and we became a witness to other people who saw that. In fact, that happened years ago, and this person remembered the other day. Why? Because it's become a witness that when we love the Lord, even our enemies are no longer at odds with us. As Don comes up tonight, I want to challenge you that we have a job ahead of us. As we get into Exodus, some, some of you might lose focus of some of these topical messages that we hear from. I call this vitamin C for the soul. But it's good that we remember these things. Because the truth of the matter is that we deal with these practical things on a day-to-day basis. But as the body of Christ, we need to love one another. It's time that we stop the anger that we have for somebody because they might go to another church. It's time that we stop any hatred that we have for somebody because they left here and did something that you don't like. It's time that we stop, that we repent, that we turn our faces to God and say, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. You know why? Because God has so much for you. I always say this, and I've said this several times, maybe to you. I believe that one day, this is just my crazy mind, maybe because I drink energy drinks, I don't know, but... I believe one of the first things that's going to happen in heaven, this is fictional, is that we're going to get taken to this bank vault. And in the bank vault, you know, Peter's going to say, because it's always Peter, he's going to go 15 to the right, 20 to the left, and my, my code's going to be real long, you know. But as he opens it, there's going to be these diamonds and pearls and gold bars and just rubies, and we're going to be like, wow, that's so cool, man. This is all mine. And he's going to say, no, Bonehead, this is all the stuff that you could have used if you would have just forgiven your brother, sister. But God couldn't use you any further because you had that hatred. You had that, you had that strife against your brother and sister. God couldn't bless you. He couldn't work in your life. He can't work with that. Leave it at the cross. Leave it alone tonight. I don't know who I've spoken to tonight, but as we stand and as we pray, Father God, I just, uh, what an awesome time in your word tonight. Father, I admit even from this stage, Lord, that there are people in my life who I don't like as much as I like other people. And Lord, daily, you bring them to memory and I ask you, forgive me. Father, how many times, and I'm not bragging, I'm just being honest, how many times have I called a brother or sister and said, listen, I had this against you and I want to ask your forgiveness. Not one time has it failed that you have the glory in it, Lord. And I pray right now that if there's any animosity towards a single person, hatred towards a single person within your body, Lord, that you would allow that person right now to deal with that, that you would convict their hearts, Father God. Lord, as always, we lift our face to you. Lord, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would just pray with me. Lord, I'm a sinner. I realize tonight that I am condemned without you. Lord Jesus, I need you so bad. And I heard Pastor Adam say that you gave your life for my sin, and I accept that tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive me for my sin, that you would cleanse me from all unrighteousness, that you would welcome me with open arms into your family, the family of God. Lord, I want to experience this love that Pastor Adam's talking about. If that was you tonight, I pray that you would know that Jesus does forgive you. He will cleanse your sins and cleanse your heart from all unrighteousness and make you a family member in the family of God.